Last week, we featured an episode that went into the history of Goju-ryu Karate. There is a link in the description if you haven't seen it, but we take a bit of a dive into one of Okinawa's pillar karate systems. In that episode, we had Goju Karateka and scholar John Paul Williams as a guest. He gave us some great insight into the history, and he also just published his book, Goju-ryu Karate Do Desk Reference Volume 1, which is a very detailed documentation of the history of the art. Today he is with us to talk about his experience with Goju-ryu, the research he put into the books, addresses some misconceptions, and talks about where Goju-ryu is today. So I'd like to talk a little bit about your background. Um, so you started training in Goju-ryu in 1974. Did you particularly look for that art to set out with, or did you explore different arts to begin with? Actually, I didn't. I had no idea that it was Goju. I was a little kid at the time, maybe uh, five years oldish or so. And it's where uh, my dad went. And the kids of the parents just sat in the corner. It was mostly men, and I think were two women. Uh, after a little while, one day someone caught on that we were all counting. The sensei would say, Ich ni san shi, and we'd say, Go rub the touch. It was just kind of a funny thing. And before we knew it, we all had dogio. I don't even remember the first day or the introduction or anything. I just remember one day we're in the corner and another day we're not. So once you started training in the art, what made you continue with it? I started in New York. Uh, and when we came to California, my sister and I came to California, uh, there was no thoughts about putting this into anything. And, and I was taken to, um, let's see, the first place was judo. Uh, and that was for just the summer program. And by chance that was with Keiko Fukuda, who was the teacher of it. And later on, we didn't know she was big and important at the time, but later on, of course, she became the most senior female judoka in the world. Uh, wow. And she was a student of, G she would happen to be a student of Jikoro Kano, but in 1975, 76, 77, no one thought about that. And as a little kid, I didn't think of that. I just thought of her, of her as a, the kind lady who taught at the dojo. We went on to, or I went on to, let's see, Samuda Kwan and Taekwondo uh, at a few different locations. And then I didn't find Goju-ru again until maybe 1985 or 84. So uh, our godmother per se, a uh, lady who was like my family friend that really took us around and took care of me, uh, she stumbled upon a karate instructor. Uh, and his name was Cornell Watson. By chance, Cornell Watson was on the very first WKF team to Japan in 1970. And he just happened to live around the corner. We didn't even know. I can hit his house with a football. No idea. Quite simply put, I saw the fist on the wall. I knew that was home again. So stayed with it since then. So yeah, he was animate. Uh, and he had a saying that Goju players know their opponents and know more about other styles than the people who actually practice them. I don't know exactly how serious he was about that, but it opened us up enough that we wanted to explore what were the Shito Ru guys doing? What were the Wado Ru and Shotokan Ru guys doing? Uh, what were the Kobu Jitsu guys doing? He, he didn't teach Kobu. Uh, even what were the Taekwondo and Muda Kwan guys doing? Tang Sodo guys doing? That was really big around the area back then. Uh, we had Ernie Reyes, West Coast Taekwondo here in town. And I even trained with him for maybe a year and a half, I think. Let's say for an example, working with the guys from Taekwondo and, or Kuk uh, I Of course, they have a lot of kicks. And they can be kicks from wherever. They're going to get that foot launched off and it's going to get you unless you know what to do. Uh, for a Goju-ryu player, because we practice so much sabaki, uh, Goju-ryu players should understand to close that distance so you're not in the range of the kick. Out of the range of their kick would be closer to them. And since they don't use hands as much, of course, goju has a lot of grappling. So go straight in and take over from the inside, not from the outside. And Goju-ryu is a close fighting art. So working with the Taekwondo guys, the Kuksu Wan guys, the Muda Kwan guys, spectacular opportunity, as well as it is for them, because they get to work with an opponent who fights close by, 
fights. You have to get the experience to understand your opponent. You need to learn about your opponent. When it comes to Goju Ryu, it's so deeply rooted in Okinawan karate. Um, how would you say it differs from other styles of karate? Like any distinctive features or elements that go into the art that people might not know about? One of the biggest things, of course, everything in Goju is Sanchin, Sanchin, Sanchin. You know, the heavy breathing, the mm -hmm. breathing. Everything is Sanchin. That's the beginning, that's the middle, that's the end. But the other major component of Goju is Sanchin stance, the hourglass stance, getting it correct, making sure your knees are over your, over your toes. Uh, your posture is vertical. Uh, you're breathing from the lower abdomen below the belly button, the hara. Uh, a lot of it posture. Then there is the body toughening, which is kote kitai, when we hammer, hammer, hammer arms together for upper block, lower blocks, everything else. Uh, and of course, then there's the body conditioning. And Goju is huge on body conditioning, which is why we use those weird or rudimentary uh, kind of archaic uh, tools, uh, the chi shi, the uh, nigiri game, which is uh, the two vases that are just filled with sand and you're carrying them with your fingertips. Uh, you have to be strong, not just on the outside, on the muscles, but on the inside, which are heart. So regardless of how much it hurts, regardless of how hard it is, you just keep on going. You persevere. You, what, what the real meaning of os is, you keep pushing. My old teacher, Cornell Watson, he required us to submit a 20 page thesis uh, for our black belt test. And I submitted 100. Uh, then shortly after I started running the website, gojru.net, uh, and I started writing articles on gojru.net. Uh, when he died, by the time he died, I had a somewhat accurate, maybe 50% accurate, 50% inaccurate history of Goju And it wasn't so great. It's a lot of people still have copies of that on their websites today. Uh, the version on my website is gone. I completely revamped that website. But what I did was I took all of those articles and the historic timeline, and I thought I was going to put it into one book and include all the kata of Goju. It turned out that the history of Goju itself was so vast I can, it took up 75% of volume one. Now there's still four more volumes to follow. Uh, the introduction of the book is mostly uh, explaining what is karate, what is budo, and why is karate a budo? What is gojiru karate do, and why is it a karate? And then going through systematically, historically, chronologically, the timeline for Gojiru and the history of events that relate to Gojiru in one way or another. So overall, it's 20 years of work, but I didn't really start outlining it until May of 2016. So when you turned in your your, your thesis, your essay, what was the what was the feedback that you got on that? Oh, he handed it back to me the next day and said it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Did that help? Kind of prompted you to go look more into it more. Typical sensei, just wrong, wrong, wrong. Uh, other people, he handed theirs back to them that day. But for me, he at least took a look at it because it was kind of thick. And of course he said wrong. But you have to understand the guy was a, he worked at Stanford Linear Accelerator, which they do atomic testing for the military and for the government. Uh, he was a graduate of UCLA uh, School of Engineering. So he was strict, 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 must be perfect, must be perfect. If it is, he's not gonna tell you. He's going to tell you, go do it again. And that was just his way. Uh, and it, being that stern with a knucklehead teenager was good for me. Yeah, he died in 2015. And that's why in 2016, I was really looking for how can I show my respect for him. And that's when I started organizing the one book that ended up turning into five. So this is just the very first one. So you, uh, the book description mentions that um, you try to dispel a lot of martial arts myths. Can you give us an example of some of what those myths might be? No disrespect to Yamaguchi, but Yamaguchi Gogen said eh, that he received his 10th don from Miyagi. Uh, and it wasn't actually from Miyagi. It was, Miyagi was named as an honor, as the honorary president for, uh, for Gojukai, Japan. Uh, so he didn't actually sign it stamp appears on it but that's because he's the honorary president of the association 
So one method without making either look bad and without giving a personal opinion was I just display the 10th Don certificate and make a brief, brief uh, comment on this is the th certificate, here's the date, here's whose name, here's whose stamp. However, that person, Miyagi Sensei, was the honorary pres president of Goju Kai and wasn't the voted president. Uh, another myth would be, say, uh, Miyagi was evacuated from Okinawa. And most people don't really realize that he was off the island. Or I, I set up an example giving uh, two of his daughters died on board a ship that was being evacuated from Okinawa. So a few of his children died during the, during the war. Uh, simple, simple little tidbits here and there that were always kind of misconceptions, misconceptions. And they were mostly answers to my own questions. And I'm sure a lot of other karate and koju people had the same questions of, if this was here and this was here, how is that possible? And I don't say anything about any of it or the myths being impossible. I just provide the dates, the scenario and the situation and a possible photo to back up the scenario. And I let the reader draw their own conclusion because I don't want to be the bad guy in it. But if there's a picture of you in Hawaii and everybody says that you were in China doing research and it doesn't work out very well. So this fixes a lot of people's dates. How did you find the resources to confirm a lot of these details? Yes. Believe it or not, Taiwan uh, has a lot of libraries and information that I would say outdo the National Diet of Japan. The National Diet of Japan is like uh, the Library of Congress for USA, but theirs is fully digitized. Taiwan is even in more in depth and has more information available. Uh, then there's one of the one of my biggest references that really helped to get everything up and going was the Encyclopedia for Karate and Kabuto. So this started getting the ball churning and really organizing some of the dates. I found a few dates in here that were impossible for some people also. Can't include them. All I can do is what can I include that's crop reference in more than one place? And I can say, okay, this I guarantee is correct because there's also photo evidence to go along with it. And other major instructors. You know, if, if Ken Wamabuni's book says that this photo was with he and Miyagi and whatever dates and the encyclopedia says the same, okay, we can go with that and say that's correct. If Miyazato's book includes the same information, then okay, we can have a, two different cross references that come to the same conclusion we can say this is accurate and true. Some things were from newspaper clippings. Okay, we can say those are accurate and true. Uh, some things were pure myth and hypothetical. Somebody wrote on the internet, okay, toss that out the window. We'll come back to it later because there might be supporting evidence for it, but a lot of that's gone. Sewakai was actually founded in 1972 by Suji Tazaki, uh, and he was a, a senior student of Yamaguchi Gogen at the time. The organization continues today under the leadership of his senior student, Fujiwara Seiichi. Uh, we continue our training. Of course, we're uh, under the umbrella of JKF Gojukai, and you know, we follow quite closely the teaching for OGKK with a lot of the sport applications of Japan Karate Federation and WKF. Any advice to somebody who is looking to join Gojuru? Like, what should they look for in terms of trying to find a school? Is there a difference in the way certain lineages train? So what should someone look for when they're trying to find a school? I would say, first off, don't simply go to your neighborhood dojo. You might find something that's 10 minutes further away that's going to be much better for you. I was contacted recently by a friend in Alameda and she and her husband were taking their daughter to they, to trial lessons at a place. And they wanted her to sign in for a contract for one year and get this at a price of $800 a month or, or $45 per class. I went to look at the credentials of the instructor uh, and it said, 
eighth degree black belt. First of all, he teaches Chinese martial arts. There's nothing wrong with Chinese martial arts. But he called himself Shihan. Yeah, over the sign it says karate. He's teaching Chinese martial arts. He calls himself Shihan, which is Japanese also. And he mixes in uh, Taekwondo Pumse Kata for everything, which amazingly, pums, one of the Pumse Kata was the requirement for the black belt. I'm sure some Taekwondo guys have made the same funny face that I made. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, if that's how he wants to make his money, I can't knock him for it. If it's working, it's working. Uh, there's going to be a lot of questions to be asked. So I would say just do basic research. Call another martial artist that you know and ask them what they think and be cautious even with their inputs because it's not, it might not be their style. They might be, not be pleased that you're not going to their Shotokan Ru class or their Wado Ru class, their, their style. A great instructor, uh, you don't find his name on the Megan's Law list. You gotta look, you do have to look. Uh, and if they work at a park and rec, that means that they've had their background checked and they've been fingerprinted. So it, do your background work, uh, run a check, bio, don't be afraid to take a look. If they're karate, check the USA Karate website and see if they're listed as uh, a participant or a member. If they're not, that's not necessarily a big deal or a problem. But if they are, that means that they have a background check. That means they've come up clean if their name is listed. So you're, you've made one good step already. And also sit in on class, not sit in on a trial class, but sit in on a class or maybe even two classes. Just watch and listen to the instructor. If the instructor keeps on looking over at you to see if you're paying attention and you're listening because he wants to sell you lessons, which he has a right to sell lessons, but is he teaching or is he recruiting? And there's a- difference. You wanna make sure he's not putting on a show for you just to allure you in. You got it right on the button. Glad I didn't have to say it, but yeah. and. Take a look at the teacher and see how many times he looks over at you and he's putting on that show. When teaching, just teach. So now that we're talking about participating, we are now facing a new landscape where we're hopefully coming out of the pandemic, which took a toll on a lot of different martial arts schools that closed. Do you have any advice on uh, people going back to the schools or for school owners, anything that they could do to help kind of get back on their feet or how they should approach reacclimating to the new, to the new landscape? This is interesting because even I'm going through the same thing. Um, I see the new landscape, this is me personally, I see the new landscape as being a hybrid model. Video training is on, which is strange because 10 years ago, we shunned anybody who did a video, took a videotape of themselves and sent it across this country to someone else for review and then got a phone call with notes back. No way, but now we have live video conference. If we meet a few times in person and we meet a few times on video, the combination can work out. Video is still difficult because it's only two dimensional. In person, we can work on those smaller details and we can come back to it. So some things that we can't do on video, we'll focus on when we're in person. Some things that we can do on video, we'll stick it into the video time. Uh, working with an opponent, that's a little difficult. Your students are going to be punching air, but that's nothing more of a change than when they first started classes and they were doing basics anyway they were punching and blocking mm -hmm. air so the hybrid model is here we have to face it until uh the 3d projection arrives with lasers on each corner of your room projecting a image of the person in the middle of the room are you hinting at a new project uh no i'm hinting at what i already know i'm in the bay area silicon valley Ah, ah, interesting. <laughs> I, can go to a, I can go to a trade show and uh, there's Elon Musk as a projection walking across stage. It's here. It's expensive, but it's here. But video conferencing was expensive 10 years ago also. Right. And we should adapt and start adjusting ourselves now. Start training ourselves to get ready for it. It's coming. The, the, the goal of Budo is to become a better citizen. To become a better citizen, we also have to understand the technology that runs our current world, mm. uh, the characters of others in our current world, and our current world just went through a drastic change. So we have to adapt to it to continue on. The most successful dojo or dojang or, or Chinese martial arts clubs in the country or the world 
are going to be those who made the adaptations. So uh, just kind of the segue to talk about a little bit of the future and going forward. I understand. So you've got more volumes of the book in the work, uh, books in the works. Um, is there anything you can share with us about what they might be covering and what we could expect to see in them in future volumes? Oh, volume two, I'm going to go over how people can read their certificates. Uh, yeah, a lot of people yeah. think their fifth Don certificate it says Shihan. No, it doesn't. Almost none do. Very few organizations use a, a grade certificate also as a Shihan license certificate. Uh, I also go over where that terminology Shihan comes from for Renshi, Kyoshi, and Anshi. I list that by the dates that they were changed in volume one as a historic reference. But in volume two, I actually go over a bit more of the meaning, uh, how to read your Shihan certificate, how to read your black belt certificate or your Don certificate. Then there is a there is an old timeline that's still followed in Japan today of when grades are officially given. An example is this. I, I used to have a friend who had a 13 year old fourth degree black belt. Uh, yeah, a, th a 13 year old fourth degree black belt should not be in the same line as you. Uh, even if I was only a first degree black belt, over 50 years old, he just doesn't have the life experience nor the size to take me on. And I'm a big guy. So maybe he's learned a few things and he knows his forms or his kata or his bumse, uh, but does he have an understanding? And he might say yes. And I'm telling you, at 14, we didn't have an understanding of what we were doing, regardless of how much of a hot shot we thought we were. So I go over a lot of that. Um, I go over in volume two, what the correct line up arrangement of your class should be. What is the name of that front wall? Why is it there? How come you shouldn't have pictures of living people at the front wall? Showman has only put dead people there. You put those living people on the side or in the back. The dead people, the most respectful and the oldest. The founder of, of Goju, his picture goes up there. My teacher, uh, my teacher, uh, Fujiwara and Basi Shion, they go to the side or over here behind us. They shouldn't go on the door front. Uh, simple, they're simple things, but most people don't know this. They don't know you place the front of the room showman, the area that you bow to, is the furthest air wall away from the door. If you've ever looked at a Japanese certificate, in the upper right hand, upper right hand corner, there's always another stamp, but half of it is off the page. Most of the American members in my, I should say actually all of the American members in our own USA division, they had no idea what is that thing. So I had to, in volume two, I explained things like that. What are all these things? What are all these little nuances that make a dojo, an organization, uh, a style, what it is? John Paul, I definitely appreciate your time. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us, sharing your knowledge, sharing your work. And we definitely look forward to what you bring us in the future. Awesome. Well, hopefully if you have me back for anything or any questions you'd like to field, I'd be more than happy to jump in on it. It would be wonderful. It would be an honor, sir. Thank you. Celebrate the art of Gojuru Karate with this commemorative Forefather t-shirt, available only here at Art of One Dojo. Pick yours up on the product shelf below the video or at the link in the description.